Hello. Hello, Ms. Gray. Yes, sir. Yeah, hi. This is Representative Maxine Grad, um, Chair of the House Judiciary Committee, and we're um, calling you for your um, testimony on H610. Okay. Great. Thank you so much for um, uh, for joining us today by phone. Um, you are joined by the um, entire Judiciary Committee. Uh, we are in room 10, which is a larger room. Um, so there are people here um, in the audience, um, as well as other witnesses who are testifying. Um, and there um, are at least two um, members of the media here that are filming. And there may be other people um, in the room that are filming as well. Uh, okay. So, so welcome. And uh, uh, please start. Thank you. Okay. okay, so as you mentioned, my name is Mariah Gray. I'm testifying in support of age six kids. Um, my mom was Rosa Gray of Barely, Vermont, and she was killed by her husband um, August 13, 2013. Um, there were several incidents leading up to her death with violence and the house. And um, I think this bill would be very helpful for women in situations like my mom. Sorry if there's background noise. I have daughter is sick, so she's here. Um, You're fine. Yeah. So, um, leading up to the incident, there was police involved several times, and it was under the assumption that the firearms were taken out of the home, but we never had proof of that. We could not get into the gun safe to know. It was assumed that they were taken to his brother's house. Um, in the meantime, he was staying somewhere where he could access firearms, which was also an issue. Um, there were several times that he appeared at the house with a weapon and threatened to do what he ultimately did, um, actually twice. Um, and my sister interfered with that. Um, so I think that if we could have had more um, support in making sure that it was more challenging for him to obtain a weapon that um, mom might still be here. Um, otherwise, <coughs> I'm just trying to read my notes here. Um, she did get two um, restraining orders, but it, they had the opposite effect that we would have hoped, so they made him more angry and more threatening, so she ended up dropping them both times. Um, but he did break them several times when they were in place, and she did not report them because she was afraid for her life and our life as well. Um, so she only said that she was going to stay so that he didn't come after her children. So I think it's really hard for somebody that's in the situation to step forward and, you know, say what's happening because they get the backlash once the police leave. So I think there needs to be a more stronger support system as far as making sure that what's happening with the weapon is carried out and not just by word of mouth because somebody that's doing this to their partner is obviously not going to be honest which is exactly what happened in this situation. Um, I don't know where the gun that he used came from, because he had access to several. Uh, if they were at his brother's house, then he could have easily went there, but he was staying with his parents where they had firearms as well. But I think when it came out, what was used, the gun was um, his gun. I think that's really all I have. I think that this would be helpful. Is it going to save every woman in this situation or man? No, but if the person has to think longer and try harder to get a weapon, I think it might you know, make them think about what they're doing as if they have it. They might just go act on their anger in the moment. Thank you. Uh, I'm not sure if there are questions, but are you, um, are you are you willing to take questions, or would you prefer not to? No, that's fine. I can. Okay. Those, yeah. okay. Barbara, we do have a question. Thank you okay. so much for testifying. I, I'm sorry 
for your loss. It's, it's really unfortunate. Or do you think that there were <coughs> other things along the way um, that might have helped prevent this? Like even before it came to the situation that we should be thinking about? Um, probably, I mean, there was like the police, I, I can't remember the exact number of how many times that they came, but I think that it wasn't, I don't think they took it very seriously. And um, like they tried to say that, like they told my sister, if you aren't honest with us with what's happening, then you're going to find your mom dead. And I think they were just trying to scare them into talking, which doesn't work. Um, and they brought the dogs to our house once and searched for him, and he was in the closet, and they didn't find him. So then he thought it was this big joke because he could hide and nobody was going to find him. So there was a lot of factors, but, I mean, there was gun still in the home that we found after the fact. So this definitely is a big part of it. But like even in terms of um, a safe place um, for your family to be when this was going on or, or just anything that would have provided like pe more peace of mind given the situation. Right, yeah, so I actually moved out uh, two weeks prior to um, the death because I was afraid that I had went to get a restraining order myself because I was afraid. I was the one that called the cops multiple times, so now I was the target also. So um, one of the nights where he came with a gun, he actually would sit by my window with the gun. So I decided that it was time for me to remove myself from the situation as I was only 17. Um, so she, her biggest thing was that she wasn't leaving because she didn't want him to come after us if she went to a safe place so maybe if all of us could have went i don't know but it, her other thing was that she didn't want it to become a big public knowledge thing that she just wanted them to go their separate ways and be done and not have that side get the backlash of anything that was going on thank you thank you um this is um representative maxine grad again um you had um mentioned that your mom, you said, ended up dropping them. Um, and I think you were referring to the restraining orders. Um, and I'm not sure I understand that. Did you mean that she didn't um, go for the final? Can you help me understand what you meant by dropping? Well, she had the restraining order, but she didn't pursue the charges or anything because he threatened that if she didn't, that if she did, then he was going to take her life. So she never pursued anything, but he was supposed to go to court, I think on September 22nd, if I am, sometime in September. Um, and he said that he wasn't gonna live to see it. So I guess. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. This is Representative Grad again. Um, so thank you so much for, for speaking with us. And um, I too am so sorry for your, your loss and your, your courage in, in being public and coming forward, and um, this shouldn't have happened. You know? No, I agree, but hopefully we can save some other people in the future. I hope so, too. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, you take care. Thank you. You too. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Mr. Adolfo Lampamba. Hi, um, my name is Adolfo Lampamba. Uh, I'm here in support of the age 6 10. Um, in May 3rd of 2018, uh, my sister was shot and killed by her ex. Um, 
my sister's story is a long one. I tried writing something, but I didn't know where to start. Um, I'm here today, um, but I'm going to tell a little bit about my sister's story before. Um, my sister did everything, tried to protect herself and the kids. Um, she tried everything by going <coughs> to the laws, going to the court, but um, the system wasn't enough to take the guns away from the guy. Um, even 48 hours before the incident happened, my, she, my sister already had moved out of the house. Um, she called for help because he was there and he was threatening to go upstairs and shoot the whole house. She called for help. The officer responded knowing that he does have guns, but it was not enough to go ahead and take the guns away from him. Um, before my sister moving out of the house, he got arrested for something else. They took the guns away from him and handed back the guns. Um, and from there, like, days later, my sister called, looking for help. I said, look, because of his case coming up, he's acting even more violent. He's saying he's going to blow my head off. Help, please help. That was not enough to help me. I'm not here today to save my sister. But I know there's other people out there that can be saved by this. This is something my sister will want to do. It might be too late for us, but it's not too late for other families out there. There's a lot more people out there that can be saved by this. <coughs> I'm not here to ask today to take guns away from people. I'm here to make sure when we do that, we know who should be having a gun and when to take away from them. We can save other people. It might be too late for us, but not for all the families. Thank you. And um, would you take questions if there are any? Hi. Um, thank you for coming forward. I'm, I know this is, I can't imagine how awful this is, and I appreciate your, your willingness to be here. I have the same question for you that I had for the woman on the phone. Like what, <coughs> what else might have been helpful that we as a state could be doing to keep your family safe? I mean, what the state can do, what the system can do is make it easier for it. not just to, for like maybe even the officers to see something and like, especially for this guy here, they know he was a bad guy, but they, they didn't have enough to take it, the guns away from him. I mean... <clears throat> The system just can't be that blind to not notice that this guy is not a good person to keep handing them the weapons. Um, I mean, 48 hours, she called for help, but nothing happened, even though he, that they, he does have a gun in the car. And told them he's got guns and ready to use at any time. 
even a video, it's like, it's gonna blow her head off. And that's exactly what he did. But it was not enough to take the guns away from him. And she was not the first one to come forward with this. And how much more does the system need? Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you for your courage and coming <coughs> forward to to hopefully help others. You know, we're so sorry this happened, and do what we can to to work and to work with you to to prevent other tragedies like this. So thank you very much. testifying today on behalf of the Domestic Violence Advocacy Group, Courtney's Allies. Uh, thank you very much for allowing us to come and speak today to share our experience and support victims of domestic violence and gun violence. Um, my name is Alex Jones. I am the treasurer of Courtney's Allies. Okay, take, take your time. Our organization was founded in 2018 after the shooting and murder of our dear friend and longtime state employee, Courtney Gaborio. She was 29. On July 4th, 2018, our lives were forever changed when Courtney was shot and killed by her ex-partner. The events that led to that day were regrettable and preventable. Courtney had left the abusive relationship seven months prior to her death. She had taken all the correct steps to remove herself from the situation. She lived in an apartment with myself as her roommate. Courtney loved life and was excited about every day, but she still lived in fear and took precautions because she knew her ex-partner was dangerous. She had spoken with people in his life about her concerns with his behavior and stated that she was scared because she knew he had possession of firearms. Her pleas for help were ignored because people close to him did not believe he could be a threat when in fact he was. She had also asked his roommate to hide his gun because she was in fear of what he may do. Because he had access to a firearm, he was able to break into our apartment at 7 a.m. and shoot her multiple times. Had he not been in the possession of a firearm, the events of that day could have turned out very differently. This event divided our community and destroyed the lives of those close to her. A group of Courtney's supporters came together after her death to hold a vigil for her. It was after that we decided we wanted to keep fighting for her and others like her. This is when Courtney's Allies was formed, and since then we have dedicated ourselves to raising awareness, fundraising, and engaging the community in our cause. Today we are here to advocate for change at the legislative level. <clears throat> My name is Kate Root, and I am the Vice President of Courtney's Allies. Stories like hers are not unique, as we know from hearing <coughs> testimony today. Uh, access to a firearm by an abusive partner increases the risk of death for victims by 500%. Courtney was planning to seek a protection order, but she was fearful of how her ex-partner would react, knowing that he owned a gun and other weapons. Um, a gunshot is an easy and a permanent solution to a toxic and temporary situation. 
The possession of a firearm by an assailant makes situations like Courtney's extremely dangerous. As it stands, we have heard stories of victims and survivors that refrain from getting a protection order against a violent partner because they do not believe that the order holds any weight. Bill H610 would change that as any abuser with a protection order against them would have to surrender their weapons and their guns and it would, they would not be able to purchase a gun while the order is in place. Restricting access to firearms will make it that much harder for a domestic abuser to enact moral harm to their partner or ex-partner. And when Courtney's Allies was formed, our intention was not only to fundraise and raise, raise awareness, but also to push for changes in how domestic violence situations are handled and prevented. Our vision is to see zero domestic violence related murders in the state of Vermont every year and the passing of Bill H610 could only help bring our vision to life. Conceivably, this bill could empower victims to seek protection orders, knowing that action will actually be taken to increase their likelihood of survival. <coughs> and um, thank you for your consideration and giving us this platform. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so <coughs> the uh, red flag law, or uh, the um, extreme risk protection order component of the uh, of this bill uh, seeks to expand to family members being able to uh, seek removal of firearms if an individual is uh, of extreme risk to themselves or others. Could you comment on, on on that particular aspect of the bill? How you see that might assist in these situations? Well, just from the testimony, the first testimony earlier, she said that she had been the one to call the cops. So many times um, and that she was she was in fear of her life and that's why she left the house so in her situation I think that that would have been definitely helpful and it would be something that would be beneficial in the future to all you know people in the situation <coughs> I'm gonna ask you the same question because I'm curious again um, and in Courtney's case, it had obviously, she had left her partner for seven months, though. Are there other laws, changes, resources that the state could or should be doing that would have made Courtney safer? Um, I know there was, I think I believe on July 1st, three days prior, there was a law that was put in about um, online stalking or online harassment. And I, unfortunately, it wasn't soon enough in her case, but um, I think that is definitely a huge thing because he was harassing her via text messages, Facebook messages, social media. Um, so I think had you know that been in place prior, that could have helped, but now that it's in place, so hopefully that will help somebody else. Um, yeah, um, so recently I, I was reading an article in one of the local news outlets where um, a, a man was accused of domestic assault and he was only arrested when they found out he had a expired license. So to me, I think that it would be make much more sense that if someone is, you know, someone is stating that they're being abused or that they're in fear of their life, maybe you should make an arrest at that point and not have to look for other ways to take that person in. Um, because I, to me, that seems like a bigger offense than having an expired license. Yes. And, and, um, writing notes are kind of around that same thing. Um, I'm not looking for any answers right now, but uh, at some point, you know, through all this testimony, and well, because I don't, I don't remember what the penalties are for violating a restraining order. You know, whether it's uh, using the phone, physically showing up, you know, uh, the online social media stuff, so, um, or even threat through another person. So that, that's one thing I'm, uh, I'm interested in because, um, you know, to get somebody potentially off the street even for a short period of time, a cooling off period, right, um, could be really beneficial. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, if he had been in custody, you know, when he was on his rant, um, it would have been different. If someone had, could have said, okay, he's, you know, acting crazy, he's threatening me, and that would have been enough to take him in, that could have 
been really helpful for me. So when, when did this happen? I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know. Uh, July 4th, 2018. Thank you. Again, thank you, and um, so sorry also for, for your loss, and, and thank you for organizing and being a voice for not only for Courtney, for, but for others. Yeah, thank you. Take care. Dr. Bursati here? Is he? Take a quick recess. I know. Thank you. Chair with the Attorney General's Office. Um, as the committee likely remembers, the Attorney General himself came in and testified last week on this issue and gave a um, general uh, statement with respect to strongly supporting this bill. Um, so I won't go through that again. And the individuals that you've already heard from this morning have certainly lent more weight and gravity to the importance of this issue than I possibly can. Um, the committee also heard from Sarah Robinson with the network who gave a good overview of the policy issues. So in light of that testimony that you've already heard, I'm going to keep confining my remarks this morning to some more technical aspects, uh, legal aspects of the bill, and hopefully answer some questions if there are any. Um, looking, I will address the warrant requirement primarily in this bill. Uh, that is one of the key aspects we have to address and to be sure that we are uh, moving forward in a manner that passes constitutional muster. I won't bury the lead here. We do think this passes constitutional muster. Um, the language around the warrant requirement that you see uh, that was put into both the temporary and final order amendments in this bill uh, is actually taken directly from a, or it's taken nearly directly from a, Supreme, a New Jersey Supreme Court case. New Jersey has a statutory scheme that's very similar to what we are, what this committee is proposing uh, in this bill. It allows for a warrant to issue um, essentially at the same time that a relief from abuse order issues. Again, that is very similar to what we are proposing to do here, essentially the same thing we're supposed to, we're uh, working on doing here. Um, <coughs> And as we, whenever we get into issues of taking property, potentially entering somebody's home, uh, those really rub right up against Fourth Amendment issues, and we have to be careful that we are within the law on those issues so that uh, any bills don't get struck down in the future. Um, the New Jersey Supreme Court, in addressing their statutory scheme, held that um, the courts had to meet certain requirements in order to issue a warrant. Well, they decided a couple things. One, they decided that you did have to issue a warrant in these circumstances. Um, that, that a warrant exception, or I should say an exception to the warrant, warrant requirement would not apply to this circumstance. So this bill has been modeled to take in that ruling into account. I should stay, take a quick, quick step back here and note that uh, even though a New Jersey Supreme Court case would not be binding on the courts of this state, um, generally courts look to similar rulings, even if they're not binding, they can be persuasive on a court, and because of the similarity of these two statutory structures, it's reasonable to expect that a court will take this ruling into account, and uh, we are doing the same thing in this legislation. Um, <coughs> So the New Jersey Supreme Court did decide that there does have to be, there is no warrant, uh, exception to the warrant requirement. A warrant does have to issue. Whenever a warrant issues, it has to issue upon probable cause. And the New Jersey Supreme Court decided that there are three primary factors that have to be met. Um, and you'll see, I believe the first mention of them is on page seven of the bill as introduced. And 
lines four through uh, eight contain those three requirements. One is that there are firearms in the defendant's possession, ownership, or control at the time the order is issued or while it is in effect. Two, the defendant has committed an act of abuse. And three, a search for and seizure of the firearms is necessary to protect the life, health, or well-being of a victim on whose behalf the relief is sought. And the court decided that if probable cause is found with respect to those three elements, a warrant can issue and um, law enforcement officers can seize weapons. Uh, when a warrant, you know, the, one of the underlying bases for issuing a warrant is what in v Vermont court language has sometimes phrased it as a, whether a person of reasonable caution would think that an offense has been committed and that there is evidence of that offense in the place to be searched. And that analysis will uh, be a part of these decisions as well. So they'll look at these factors uh, and also say, is the place that you are asking for a warrant likely to have weapons? So the warrant will have to have reasonable specificity with respect to the place. Um, and that is uh, the information gathering <coughs> that will have to be done is uh, partially the option for it is provided for in the bill with respect to when somebody makes an application for an RFA. Uh, but additionally, it may well be the case that there will have to be uh, further information established during a court hearing if a court is going to be able to issue a warrant. As a larger matter, I should say, it's important for the committee to keep in mind that it's not necessarily the case that a warrant is going to issue in every case. It's entirely possible that an RFA could be uh, issued, that there's enough information to support that and meet the standard for that, and that there won't be enough information to meet the standard for the warrant to issue. Uh, or, of course, it's possible that there's they're simply weapons aren't a part of the situation, that that is also a possibility. But it, the committee should remember that because we're adding this warrant requirement, adding this possibility that uh, law enforcement could go in and get weapons, it does not mean that's going to happen in every case. And I expect that it won't happen in every case. There will be cases where either their weapons genuinely seem not to be involved or there isn't enough information for the warrant to issue. And I, you know, judges will do what they do all the time, which is make uh, assessments about the evidence and uh, reliability of that evidence to determine whether um, they can meet the standard and issue the warrant. Um, and Dave, excuse me, is that the reason yeah. for the, the may, the permissive language that the court may issue a warrant? Yeah, yes, I mean, so it, it does say that. And it should not be shall, I Well, I should say that um, there is a shall for the relinquishment part of it, but, but the court on, um, and just to make sure we're not getting the two things confused, so if you look at subsection A on page, or I should say 3A on page 6, the court will order the relinquishment, but if you go to page 7, the court may issue a warrant, because it certainly would not be constitutional to say the court shall issue a warrant, since they do have to make that assessment about the evidence. The relinquishment, re <laughs> relinquishment would only happen if the warrant was issued. Right. No, so the relinquishment order will issue and the person will be under an obligation to relinquish weapons. Um, and, and that, there, there's no constitutional issue there. It's an order for somebody to do something in, that the court, you know, the legislature is saying the court has okay. the power to order that. And, but there's no issue of state actors trying to enter somebody's home or take somebody's property. That's where we run into the Fourth Amendment constitutional issues. So the relinquishment order is, is not a constitutional problem. The okay. constitutional issue that we have to make sure we're addressing properly is the warrant. Right. Yeah, I, didn't, I just wasn't sure what the, the process was yeah. and the steps. Because to the average person, I guess, to me anyway, it would be warrant first, then the order for re relinquishment. But Okay. Yeah, okay. I, I, but I, I understand what you're saying. Now. Right. I think yeah. actually, and thank you. For that. I think it might be helpful maybe if you go back to the language or give us a scenario, really help us understand step by step. Sure. So, so real quick, is that happening now? The re relinquishment. It can happen now. It can. Okay. Uh, it is not required for it to happen right. now. Um, so sure. Let me give a hypothetical of what might happen. Mm -hmm. Somebody comes in, uh, fills out the form. 
and let's say it's a daytime, to make keep things simpler, it's, the court is open, it's a daytime uh, request for a relief from abuse order. Uh, they, and let's do the emergency relief from abuse order to start with. The person goes in, asks for the relief from abuse order. Uh, the court finds that there is sufficient evidence to issue that RFA, and they add conditions to it. And, and in the statute, there's a bunch of different conditions they are allowed to put on the order. The standard ones are stay at what we would call uh, in the colloquial, colloquially stay away orders, um, saying you have to be a certain distance away or can't be in a certain area. The, uh, subject of the relief from abuse order, the respondent, um, has to stay away as, as <coughs> distance, or perhaps there might be conditions about where people can live. There might be sort of temporary custody orders issued. So the um, orders issued. So all of those things are your standard relief from abuse order process. All of them might happen. What this bill is saying that in addition to those standard conditions that might be placed on a relief from abuse order, they're happening now there will also be a relinquishment order for weapons. Um, so, so that's sort of the first step. We have somebody coming in. The, if there's enough evidence, the relief from, from, relief from abuse order is issued, and it is issued with conditions. What this bill also does is say, well, with respect to the weapons issue in particular, <coughs> we are going to give the court the power to decide whether it is going to issue a warrant. And now, now we come to a second decision point, which is, is there enough evidence to issue the um, warrant? And that now we have to go to the probable cause standard, which this bill will have the three prongs that I spoke about a few minutes ago, and also the standard probable cause analysis of whether um, the evidence being sought will, is in the place where you know, there's reasonable likelihood it's in the place specified. And so there'll have to be those prongs met as well. Those prongs will have to be met as well. So that's sort of the, and, and then after all that, issue the warrant and the law enforcement would um, act in accordance with the warrant. So that's sort of the process. You've got complaint, order issued with a bunch of conditions, and then as a new additional process, potentially, a warrant issuing, but the warrant does not necessarily issue, even if the order does issue. Was that a help? Was that a, what you were looking for, Chair? Um, yes. Um, with the uh, with the RFA, I, I just want to clarify for myself. With an RFA, the re relinquishment becomes automatic for on, firearms. Yeah, okay. on the, under the okay. on the language right. of the bill. Yeah. So a, a question that that I have overall with our if, RFAs, if, if it's a couple that's living together and there's an RFA, of course you have, you're you supposed to stay away, why aren't uh, vacate orders uh, issued at the same time? To, to me that, that would make sense and, and, and possibly put a, a little more teeth into the law, you know, you know into the uh, yeah, keeping um, people separated. No, that's a good point. <clears throat> vacate, order, vacate orders can be issued. Right. Under the current law, and I, I believe that they are being issued under the current At the same time with an RFA? That's right. Is okay. that what you mean by stay away? Is a vacate order? It's not necessarily the same uh, thing, but right. Um, right. Right. the vacate or order can be issued under current law. Right. So, and, and that leads to another question that I, I had written down the other day, and thank you for saving this, is so, oh, say, say if a person has an RFA, a uh, and, and they have a you know they have firearms whether it's one or a collection, and a vacate the premises has also been ordered, so they're they're separated from their from their firearms. Does does do the firearms still get confiscated even though they're not living at the premises anymore? So that's a good question, and the que the question you're raising about where the firearms will go and who will keep them. Uh, goes to another statute, which is already in law, 20 VSA 2307, which is referenced at line 10 of page 7 on the bill. And that already has a process for uh, relinquishment that applies to other situations that are already in law. That process does, <coughs> um, uh, I should say, it favors, it, it defaults towards having uh, law enforcement or um, uh, Federally licensed, fire, federally licensed firearm dealer 
hold those weapons, but it does contemplate the possibility that a third party could hold the weapons as well, so that option is available. And I suppose, you know, sort of thinking about hypotheticals here, it's possible that um, a judge could find that a third party at a home is sufficiently, that where somebody, that somebody's vacated, is sufficiently in control of the weapons. I think that's going to be a very case specific inquiry right. and, a, and a judge is going to have to make a decision yeah. about whether um, the individual who controls those weapons is actually going to carry out that order uh, in, in an adequate way. Yeah, sure. Um, the penalties for violating a restraining order or a, a vacate, um, I'm going to assume they may be a little different. but. Um, I guess, you know, whether uh, somebody's using a phone, physically showing up, threats through another person, of course, in this day and age, the online social media harassment. What, what are the penalties? Uh, let's, let's just stick with RFA so we don't complicate it too much. And so I guess, what are the penalties for violating that? So if you do violate an RFA, you will be, um, you could be charged with a crime called a violation of abuse prevention order. Um, that's the, the name of the crime. I actually, it's a misdemeanor. I don't remember off the top of my head if the penalty is one or, you know, maximum penalty of one or two years. But you do now enter into the criminal court territory. You are charged with a crime. And um, <coughs> FAPOs have long term collateral consequences as that well. Can you? Yeah, Vapo. consequences beyond. Yeah, but what VAP just. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, VAPO is the uh, oh. slang acronym for violation of abuse prevention order. Okay. Sorry about that. That's all right. Um, and for example, they are not, even though they're a misdemeanor, they have <coughs> expanded expungements, those are not eligible for expungement. Um, so, so those are, even though they're a misdemeanor, um, they do carry some right, long term right. consequences. So, uh, it, um, one thing you said that I kind of have a problem with is you said long-term ramifications in, in, in what we're trying to address with, with this bill is the, you know, the immediate threats. So, and I think okay. just to give context there, anytime you get into criminal court, you're talking about long-term ramifications. Right. So it's not so much about what this bill does or doesn't do, it's that once you've committed a crime or are charged with a crime, it doesn't really matter what it is, you're entering into some potentially long-term yeah. ramifications, and that's yeah. what I mean by that. Yeah, no, no, and I realize that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Martin, and then another, yeah. Um, I have a few questions. Uh, I'll start with the easiest one. What is the New Jersey case, the citation? Oh, just so we have that on the record. Hemingway, and I can get you the number. State v. what? Hemingway, H-E-M-E-N. W A Y. Yeah, and if you can send a case just so we can put it on, yeah, on our yeah. system uh, and have it part of the record. So, a couple other questions. So, if there if there's a, a an RFA issued uh, without the requirement that weapons must be relinquished, uh, perhaps because it's shown that the person doesn't have any firearms, there's no evidence that the, that person has firearms. What would keep that individual from subsequently? purchasing the firearm, uh, getting the firearm in some manner? Well, so the relinquishment order still include, which is the shaft, you know, the, the relinquishment order is not optional. Under well, under current, yeah, under current law, I meant, I'm sorry, under oh, current okay. law, if the court doesn't issue a relinquish, or doesn't put that in the order that firearms must be relinquished, uh, <clears throat> what keeps an individual from <coughs> going and purchasing a firearm? There wouldn't be anything that would prevent that individual from doing that. So relief from abuse orders that are put on the, the instant background check system, are those only relief from abuse orders that include a prohibition of holding firearms? So there is a federal, yeah, so we get into the issue of what federal law um, prohibits. And federal law does prohibit somebody who's the subject of a, and, and if I'm going to characterize this incorrectly, I'll have the network uh, correct me, but I believe it's final relief from abuse orders for which a person has notice and has been served. So when we're talking about temporary relief from abuse orders, uh, that would not be covered under the federal prohibition. Even the federal prohibition would, that. would not cover that. That's right. right. All right. So um, if you could just comment on the fact that we're in a civil court context and really warrants 
fall under kind of criminal law, generally speaking, if you could comment on that. Certainly. So a couple comments on that. This was an issue that the New Jersey Supreme Court confronted as well. Um, essentially, it is possible, and it, does, it is legally permissible under the Fourth Amendment and uh, <coughs> under federal Supreme Court case law that <coughs> civil warrants can issue to enforce civil violations. So that is something that uh, is permissible and is allowable, and the New Jersey Supreme Court essentially held that Sure, there hasn't necessarily been um, a finding of probable cause of a crime here, um, because it isn't in criminal court, as you point out. But it is allowable to have uh, civil or administrative warrants. Uh, they still do require a probable cause finding. Um, but because a relief from abuse order is issuing, and therefore there has been a finding that um, you know there's a necessity for government intervention, Essentially, that is um, sufficient to sufficient grounding for that civil or administrative warrant issue. And again, that was the grounding for State v. Hemingway. I would add one thing: there will be circumstances in under Vermont law, assuming the bill passes as something similar to what it is now. Uh, it does include a an expansion <coughs> of prohibited persons. <coughs> it would expand it beyond what federal law requires right now. So if you look on page 10 of the bill, at the bottom there, section 4, it does now make somebody a prohibited person even if they're subject to an emergency order as well as a final order. Now the significance of that is that, um, you know, a violation of that is a crime. So if somebody, as soon as somebody has notice, they are, uh, and, and they retain possession when they're not supposed to, they are now committing a crime. So there is a sort of criminal basis. However, there are going to be circumstances when, and let me back up, I skipped ahead of thought. So if you're in a courtroom uh, and an order is issued and the respondent is in the courtroom, they are considered, under Vermont law, they are considered to have been served at that moment. So in the courtroom, um, you know, order served, respondent's there. Uh, they are now a prohibited person, and further retention of weapons is a crime. And so you can say that now there is probable cause for uh, traditional probable cause, criminal probable cause, underlying that order. In those situations, or, or I should say underlying the warrant, if the court then moves on to the next step, as we spoke about earlier, and decides to issue the warrant. Um, in those situations where a respondent is not in the courtroom, there is going to be that gap where you're going to have to have service before the order takes effect. And that's where we get into the, where we do have to rely on the civil or administrative. <coughs> but again, that is permissible under U.S. Supreme Court law. Uh, Judge Grierson, who I know is up to testify soon, can correct me if I'm wrong. I don't believe the Vermont Supreme Court has really addressed that issue directly. Um, but uh, I could stand corrected on that. My review of the law showed that where the Vermont Supreme Court could have talked about civil or administrative warrants. They generally chose not to find a warrant requirement at all. Um, in, and in this bill, we're not trying to push the legal argument that far to say that there is no warrant requirement. The bill does contemplate having a warrant. Okay. So I do have a couple other questions, but they kind of are a little more tangential, so I'll ask those after other folks have had a chance. Okay. Okay. Martin actually asked the questions that I was about to ask. So. Okay, and then we have Matt and Barbara and Selena. Mm -hmm. New to this committee, so I'm trying to figure some things <coughs> out. Could you tell me what an average relief from abuse order looks like when it's issued? What's included in it? I'm not, I, I can tell you what it could be issued. I'm not, I feel like I may not have enough knowledge to tell you what an average relief from abuse order might be. And the network may be a better <coughs> thing to say. And we do have the form, it's not filled out, but we do, but we do have the form on our Page, yeah. But I, I can tell you briefly some of the things that may be part of a relief from abuse order. Most of the time, what does it include? Um, so a, a, a very standard condition would be the stay away, what we call the stay away condition, which is just saying you won't be in X number of feet or you won't enter a certain town or neighborhood, uh, whatever the geographical or physical distance uh, barrier the court chooses to impose that's reasonable. Um, and. Uh, so that's sort of, I would say, like the fundamental basic relief from abuse order. There's also usually no contact order, or there may be a no contact order that gets issued, and that no contact order would include 
all the various social media forms of contact, telephone contact, things like that. The reality of a lot of people's lives is that you know, if there are kids involved, um, there may have to be some limited communication and a relief from abuse disorder may contemplate limited communication or limited contact for those purposes. Um, and it could, as we talked about before, include a vacate order. Um, somebody has to leave the premises of a certain place. It, could, it also does uh, have a number of provisions around childcare. So uh, even though that's childcare and custody issues are usually dealt with in different, a different forum, um, or I should say under different court processes, not necessarily, not a different forum. Um, there are sort of temporary uh, measures that can be put in place under the relief from abuse order. So those are all things that might issue on a relief from abuse order. And they're basically a, <coughs> assuming the court, because you're dealing with people um, and the different circumstances those people are in are going to sort of weigh out what the best ways to to keep the party safe from the other. That's and exactly then, right. And then sort of tailor tailor a group of protections around that person. That, yeah, it's always going to be case specific. That's right. So um, the one thing that I've been trying to sort of figure out is why why in a situation where you're sort of evaluating a relationship or former relationship or some sort of dangerous situation between two people, why would you, what, why the, um, why the shall in that one instance? I, this really goes back to the testimony that was given last week and that's about the exceptional danger that our, um, that victims or survivors may be placed in when it comes to firearms. Mm -hmm. The data is pretty compelling on that point. Um, it's compelling both in the sense that, you know, where firearms are present, there's a, a significantly higher rate of lethality that we find in these situations. It's also compelling in the sense that the uh, hours and days after a relief from abuse order might issue are especially lethal for victims and survivors, and that a, um, a significant percentage of that lethality comes from firearm use. So the, I think it's, it's, you're raising a fair question. I think that the policy behind it really has to do with the data that we find. And by data, we mean, it's a dry word, but we mean the lived experience of human beings um, who have suffered. And the um, guns present in the home uh, or access to guns for somebody who uh, is an abuser or is found to have committed acts of abuse in under a relief from abuse order, that's an especially dangerous and lethal circumstance or potentially lethal circumstance and it's one that um, as a policy matter this bill is being written because there's a recognition of that danger, um, the special danger I should say, and that's why I believe it was drafted with a shell. Could could a similar outcome be achieved by making the shell that the court needs to evaluate Sorry, that situation? You... Could a similar outcome be achieved if the shall was to have the court evaluate whether that's an issue? Uh, do we think the court, I mean, because, I mean, what I'm, I, I'm, I'm torn here between wanting to make sure that we're creating a situation where um, victims of domestic violence are safe and feel that they can get the relief that they need. And I want to make sure that regardless of where a person goes to court or if they uh, know how to advocate for something, that it's being looked at. At the same time, I'm just really uneasy with this, with, a, with carving out one thing and saying that that has to be evaluated. So I'm trying to get to a place where I can um, find a way to ensure that regardless of where someone who's seeking a, re a relief from abuse comes into the court system, that, that this issue is getting looked at. I, yeah, I hear your concern. I think that, um, again, as I mentioned, we are supporting, we are supportive of the shall language because of the special danger that is presented by these cases and by firearms. Um, the policy outcome that we would like to see from the bill is to ensure that wherever 
even possibly necessary, weapons are being removed. The concern is that that isn't happening sufficiently right now, that people aren't sufficiently educated about that, um, and we need to make sure that that's happening. Uh, an outcome that it assures that is, is what we support. I, I understand, but the only other way I can take that is a lack of faith in the court. If you, you that if you, it, it, it's if you make a shall for evaluation of firearms and then you say that you're still worried about it, that is inherently saying that there's a lack of faith in the court system to get it right. I don't think I would say a phrase that is a lack of faith in the court system. I think the issue is that the individuals who are involved in, in <coughs> situations of domestic violence may very well not know what, you know, folks who are expert in this area do know, which is issues about lethality, issues about danger. And so they may not bring to the court the evidence that a court needs to make the decisions that would keep that person safe. I understand, and that's why I'm suggesting the court shall evaluate. And that's certainly a policy option that is open to you, and uh, uh, one that, um, that you can consider. Again, we are supporting the shall requirement because of the reasons that I spoke about a few minutes ago. Thanks. Yeah, so just follow up on that. Yeah. I, <coughs> if you comment on what I'm saying as far as having this direct question, that, but it seems to be a belt and suspender approach. What we are doing in, in this bill, if it passes as it is, is we are making the possession of firearms, if there's a relief from abuse order issued, a crime. That's the, what's on page 10. So I, the person is not to have firearms, period. But by having the shell, you're making it very clear to an individual that they're not allowed to have firearms. They're not allowed to possess them because it's criminal to be possession. One might say, well, you don't need to because it's criminal, but for extra security in the situation, you know, let's, let's put that forward that you shall not have those, those firearms you know, because it's criminal. I don't know if that made a lot of sense, but maybe you can make that more sensible uh, as far as what I just said. I, and I think your point is a good one, which is that it is a belt and suspenders approach. If you're adding in what's on page 10, it makes it a crime anyway. The reality is that enforcement is important. And the relinquishment provision combined with the warrant provision uh, in, the, um, in Title 15, in, in the RFA statutory sections are important to making sure that there actually is effective enforcement of what is, a, you know, what would be a criminal <coughs> act. And for, uh, the letters on the page are important. It means that if something goes wrong, you can hold somebody accountable. But the letters on the page do not have the preemptive enforcement power that, and when I say letters on the page, I mean the letters on the page in Title 13 where you're making it a crime to possess if the order's out there. Um, you need actions that are being allowed that the state can perform in order to make sure that somebody's safe. And that's what the relinquishment and combined with the warrant requirement allow for. Is it's not just letters on the page saying, if you do this, it's a crime. It's saying, we are going to make sure that uh, we're keeping people safe. So David, I want to sort of be crystal clear on if it's a temporary RFA and it says no weapons, that's not going to be sent off to, th that person's name is not going to be on the list. So if they relinquish their gun, they could go to Fred's gun shop and buy a gun right away. The federal coverage doesn't apply to the temporary. The, the federal uh, prohibited right. person is, does not apply to the temporary stage. And under this bill, <clears throat> would they be able to do that? Not legally, no. The question of enforcement and making sure that names are in the proper databases is an operational one that I think we do have to think about, but right. legally speaking, no. But, right, okay. But legally speaking, them, right, I mean, people, as you said, break their um, orders a lot. So it's sort of, it's still very easy for someone to purchase a gun. 
again, I, the operational aspect of how we make sure yeah, that yeah. the people are in the correct databases is frankly one that I'm not expert on, and okay. I refer you to folks who do do that okay. in the Department of Public Safety. So the two pieces that I kept hearing this morning from families was people being fearful of um, getting a relief from abuse order or reporting um, that it was broken. Do you see anything in this bill that's going to make it, um, make that any different? I, I, you know, I don't want to oversell this bill as a panacea for some sure. deep and serious challenges we have when we serve folks who are in these situations. I think <coughs> I would I would like to us to be able to write legislation that removes all fear from <coughs> those sure. types of situations. I don't know if we can do that. What I do think this does, though, is it does provide the state and provides police departments with the tools they need to do what they were trying to do in at least one of the cases that you heard about this morning, where they were trying to do the right thing and take weapons away and they had a lot of trouble doing so. And so I do think that this provides a tool that um, law enforcement and advocates can bring to survivors and say, we know this is a challenging, maybe a fearful time, but here's yet another tool that we have that we can help. And hopefully that does ameliorate some of the challenges. So that <coughs> very last question, which is, I keep hearing time and time again, um, not just from people this morning, that when they call law enforcement, it is um, not taken as seriously or as dire. And I guess I, I'm wondering how we change that. And again, I think that's a really big, a bigger question beyond what we've written here. I do think this is an important tool, but I think it also <coughs> means training for law enforcement, um, perhaps you know, increased training for law enforcement, uh, more education for, uh, and that includes dispatchers and the folks who are answering the phones. It includes the social workers who may be embedded with police departments. I think all of those are part of the bigger picture, and that is additional work we need to do beyond what's here. Um, I have two questions, and one I think is pretty quick. Um, so I think I heard you say, just, just on the issue of um, issuing warrants in civil court, that there's um, clear direction on that in the New Jersey Supreme Court decision, but also that maybe there was some federal case law that was instructed in that way. I'm just wondering. Yeah, so there is. The US Supreme Court has stated very clearly that civil or administrative warrants are allowable. It's something that's necessary when, when uh, a municipality, in a much more mundane example, a municipality <coughs> might be trying to enforce zoning laws or something like that. Uh, just because it's not a criminal action doesn't leave the government without any ability to enforce rules or regulations. And so in those cases, civil warrants, even though there's no crime, civil warrants can issue. Okay, great. And then my second question, and maybe this is a question, more for other witnesses too, but just um, to some of the current concerns um, we've heard. How, look, what do we know about how much variance there is in how judges around the state are currently um, handling you know, weapons relinquishment in RFA orders? Because certainly the the like you can evaluate it. Um, premise is there. Is there very strong variability from court to court? Or just I will have to refer you to other witnesses. Okay. On that. I don't have the, I, I know that there are, I believe there are other witnesses who can answer you on that, and I don't have that information. Yeah. Okay. David, <coughs> excuse me. Do you know if there's any information out there about um, RFAs that are? Um, Violated um, with a, with a murder resulting if if it's the first time somebody violates the RFA because some of the testimony I heard today was there's an RFA or vacate order whatever the orders and there's violation 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 then the murder and and I'll I'd kind of go back to what I was bringing up before that it seems like. There needs to be more teeth in the RFA, which I think would go further to protect people than confiscation. Because if there's more teeth in, in an RFA to 
you know, physically remove somebody from a uh, from society, even you know, for a short period of time. Um, that if they, I mean, if they're in prison, they can't they, they can't murder somebody. You know, they can't violate the RFA anymore because even if the guns are confiscated, um, there, there's ways to get a firearm. Um, I mean, whether somebody uses a knife or their hands, and the strangulation is a is, is a big thing with domestic abuse. And, um, so, not that I'm asking a question or looking for an answer for anything, but I just keep going back to that. That a, a violation of an RFA, there's there's no teeth in it. Well, I think you raise a really important point, generally, about um, making sure that, how, how do we make sure that people are protected, even with RFAs? I do think the violation of abuse prevention order offense is, does have, it, it, you know, those are teeth. Um, and it may be the case that we need to do a better job of uh, making sure that violations are being found out about, that we have more supports for survivors who, so that they, supports for survivors who, so that they can report. Um, uh, you know, I think there's a bunch of steps we can take that may not all be in, in legislation, but I think you do raise a really important point. I do think the, the violation of abuse prevention order crime is part of the answer. Um, and taking that seriously is something that we, we need to do. All right, because, because here on page 10, the way I understand it, on page 10, 10 and 11, persons subject to relief from abuse orders, prohibition on possession of firearms, um, that a person who violates this section shall be in prison not more than two years or fined not more than $1,000. Is, is that that's the penalty for violating an RFA? That's the penalty for violating the for being in violation of the prohibited persons statute, which is what you're seeing on 10 and 11. Oh, okay. The RFA which, which means exactly what? Crime. So the, uh, the <laughs> provision in section four on 10 and 11 are saying that if you are the subject of a relief from abuse order and you do possess, ship, transport, or receive a firearm, uh, you are committing a crime. Okay, um, I, I guess, I want to go right back to the basic. I've got an RFA. <clears throat> I've got an RFA against me. I violate it. What happens? Potentially, what happens? So potentially, what happens is you are you a criminal charge could be brought against you. It depends on how you violate it. It may be the case that you're subject to two different statutory sections if this bill passes. But let's say it's a run-of-the-mill violation. You contacted somebody when you weren't supposed to. You could now be charged with a crime, a violation <clears throat> of abuse prevention order. Um, and that's a misdemeanor, but it does allow conditions of release to be placed on you. It could mean, if you seem to be a risk of flight, that um, bail could be placed on you, and then you may get a criminal conviction that will stay on your record. Okay, a um, little more detail. If, if I violated the order, and, <coughs> excuse my allergies, and um, I said, uh, and, and I threatened him, I'm gonna kill you. What happens then? Is, is, is there, language I use, is there more teeth in the law to? Again, I think that's where the violation of abuse prevention order crime would come into play. Yeah. So just as, yeah, just as follow up on this, uh, I was gonna ask you questions just along that line. Isn't the big problem in this situation as far as trying to hold that individual is that unless it's a violent felony, we can't hold without bail. And I do understand that the Senate is looking at a possible constitutional amendment that will address that, but it'll take several years to get there if we get there at all. But yeah. is that really where, I mean, yeah, the problem is that if it's just a misdemeanor, unless there's the concern about flight, constitutionally, you know, under the Constitution, they, that person cannot be <coughs> held without bail. I mean, is that... No, that, that is correct. And, I, and, and the question I was going to have, I was going to be asking is, I mean, is there any way that these individuals can be held appropriately? Or? Prior to the conviction, unless they are a risk of flight, um, and that could happen, but uh, prior to a conviction, under the Vermont Constitution, it would be 
very difficult to hold them unless there is an assessment that they are a risk of flight for prosecution. And I just, yeah, I just want to make sure that that's kind of understood. Why are these individuals not being held? <clears throat> it's because of the Constitution that puts those limits on. Um, yeah, it's not the it, right. It, it's not a good answer. I mean, <laughs> well, no, it just verifies to me that uh, again. Being a layperson, that RFAs don't have any teeth in them. Right, and, and I would just add to that uh, that that's another reason. You can comment on what I was, that's another reason to get the firearms out of there because you're not going to be able to get the person out of the situation necessarily if they're misdemeanors. So get the firearms out of the situation. Yeah, I think that's a really important point. It goes back to the point you're making earlier about enforceability. We can have things written out, but we need mechanisms by which we can actually act. And, and part of what this bill does is allow for action. So by imprisoning somebody for violating an RFA, it violates the Constitution, so it violates their rights. Well, holding somebody in pretrial detention. Okay. Um, is only allowable for, uh, well, if it's not a violent felony, it's only allowable for risk of flight. After a conviction, that changes. Now you could be penalized with uh, jail time. So one of the things um, I heard from some of our other witnesses this morning is with regard to RFAs is that um, the issue isn't just that there aren't consequences for violating a relief from abuse order, but that um, both that survivors are fear coming forward with a relief from abuse order in the first place, or fear reporting the violations because of the presence of weapons. I think we heard that pretty clearly this morning. I'm wondering if you want to comment on that. Like, would further keep <coughs> in um, the consequences for violating a protection order address that question if the fear is even reporting the violation in the first place due to the presence of firearms? Again, as I said to Representative Rachelson, I don't want to sort of overstate what we can do with one change, but I do think that this is an important step forward in helping people feel more secure. I don't think that we're going to be able to eliminate those fears entirely. Um, what I do think is that if people know that this is there, if advocates who are who may be helping people can state to them, look, there's this tool available that will help remove firearms. I do think that this is a piece of the puzzle that is going to help people come forward and help people feel safer when they do. And do you think, I guess the, the other side of that question is, do you think do you think knowing that the penalties, I mean, this is a very subjective question, so just bear with me, but I, th I feel like um, part of what we're hearing is just maybe the penalties for violating or abuse, uh, uh, really from abuse order should be stronger, and I'm wondering if that gets at the, like, does that help people who are fearful about reporting violations or even violating in the first place come forward, knowing that there's more behind the process on that end? To my mind, what helps most is the enforceability aspects of it, not so much the penalties. I, I'm not sure that we have good data showing that changing penalties changes behavior all that much. But what we do have data on is that <coughs> people knowing that they're gonna get caught, or um, in this case, people, it, you know, it doesn't matter what the penalty is, the point is, there is now a mechanism to go in and remove weapons. So we're kind of outside of that, we're taking ourselves outside of that rather debatable question of whether uh, penalties change behavior. What we're saying is that we have, we are creating a mechanism where set aside penalties for a minute, we are going to remove firearms, and that's where the safety comes from. We're not trying to make guesses about what will incentivize behavior, because it's hard to know. We're saying that, not. You know, set aside incentives, set aside behavior changing, we are giving the state the ability to remove dangerous weapons. Um, thanks, David. Um, when I look back at the testimony uh, earlier uh, last week, it seems that 
there are uh, other controls that need to be uh, ensured. Uh, and I'm not sure how we go about uh, assisting making sure that they come to fruition. And the point I'm making is, for example, the high-risk teams um, that were um, <coughs> suggested, um, the better use and training around the lethality assessments. Uh, because if, if, I'm just trying to think in terms of if a local law enforcement officer you know, goes to uh, an event and he or she, you know, has that tool, you know, in their, in their toolbox, those questions that they ask in that assessment might lead them to, there is an order, <coughs> and the person might have violated that order physically. Uh, but if we're not utilizing uh, the suggested, uh, you know, tools uh, that, you know, have been proven to be successful and the data supports that, um, you know, that's, that gives credence to what uh, <coughs> Representative Burdick was talking about. You know, how do we uh, kind of wrap people up? How do we make people feel safer? you know, in that situation. If they know that when that trooper or that local law enforcement officer comes in and starts asking those questions and their brain is triggered, you know, to look for those things, uh, that's where we might be able to ensure. Uh, so that's another piece, and I'm not sure how we get to that, you know, as far as <coughs> through legislation. Great. <clears throat> and I think we'll be discussing some of that tomorrow. Okay. <coughs> yeah. I don't know Thank you. Responder. I, I would just yeah. affirm that that is a really important point and uh, I think there are frankly other witnesses who can speak to it better than I can with respect to resources, uh, help advocates who are out there to have a larger um, set of services to help people. Um, I think that's vitally important and one that we need to address as well. Selena, did you? No, no. no I'm sorry. That's all right. That's all right. So, um, so the confiscation piece of this this bill you said was found constitutional in New Jersey. Yes, this has been designed to fit right. into that right. scheme. Yeah. So, and, and I don't even pretend to know New Jersey's or all of Vermont's constitution, but um, I'm going to assume Vermont's constitution is. A little different, and, and where, where I'm going is, is uh, say if we pass this, it could be challenged. It could, right? So, um, because there's going to be some people that are going to believe that it's not constitutional. So, going back to the uh, RFAs, if we if we passed, put into this bill that somebody who does violate an RFA. Um, has to be imprisoned, it, it would stand until it's challenged. Yes, no? Again, we do have the violation of abuse prevention order, which does provide for imprisonment in the case that you're convicted of that crime. Right, right. So we do have that tool available. I think one of the If you're convicted, is, though, then there's a, there's a lot of time that's in between exactly the, right. viola the RFA, the violation, and conviction. You know, yeah. It could be your tool. Well, that's, that's where I was going with it, is the law could be passed. It, it could be put in here. Well, if you're talking about incarceration, <clears throat> with that, there are very serious constitutional um, bars you need to meet before you can incarcerate somebody. And uh, conviction is one of the main ones, that uh, one of the main ways that the state can incarcerate somebody. So having some sort of pre-conviction incarceration Regime would be very difficult to do constitutionally. Um, could I be incarcerated for uh, getting a DUI without a conviction? Again, unless you're a risk of flight from prosecution, it's unlikely. So now we're talking about now we're getting into the realm of 
what's, a, what's permissible for pretrial detention, pre-conviction detention. And that's a whole set of constitutional and statutory rules. All right, thanks. So. I had just, uh, I'll mention very briefly, because okay. I've been so, up here for a while, but I want to have time. Yeah. Um, the network had three changes <clears throat> that they had proposed, and I just wanted to say we support those three changes. Uh, I believe you've discussed them a bit with the network already, so I won't go into them again, but um, those were just about <coughs> clarifying the, that it is not required for somebody to answer questions about firearms, um, that, that was one of them. The second one was clarifying that judges retain the ability to make um, credibility decisions about evidence and uh, when it comes to um, whether somebody possesses firearms or not. And the third one is compliance monitoring. So, so on that first one, um, w where would the information come from as far as the firearms, the type and location, if not from the petitioner? Well, you may not get it, and that's a reality of this situation, but I think the concern is that if you put it in as a requirement, okay. you're now putting a burden on somebody who's trying to get help, um, and potentially it could be read to invalidate their application if they didn't do something that was required. So just being cautious about how you phrase it, saying that they may put this information down. We're not creating this to put, place burdens and barriers on people who are trying to get help. We're creating this in order to give provide tools um, but without so that information, presumably, there wouldn't be the information sufficient for establishing probable cause for the warrant. Yeah, that the is, RFA is somewhat separate from, from that component. It is likely that that would be the case. It's possible. Some, you know, I could imagine some hypotheticals out there where they'd get information some other way. But yes, you're right that it's likely that that would be the case that they wouldn't have that information. But make it optional is the yeah. main point. OK, thanks. Yeah. <coughs> Madam Chair? Yes. Um, I know in the past we've uh, asked if uh, Ledge Council um, can do flowcharts, you know, so I, I think it might be helpful, you know, as we continue our discussion to have that flowchart of what happens with an RFA, uh, you know, what happens with a temporary RFA, and then, you know, that way, you know, as, as we're uh, deliberating and taking testimony to be able to actually see that process, uh, it might help us in framing our questions a little um, more directly. Okay. <coughs> just work on it. Anything else for David? All right. Thank you. Very Thank, much. you. Okay. Thank you. So, um, let's take a break. Two minute break, please. Okay, great. great. Thank you, everybody. We are going to start again on H610. Welcome. Good morning. Good morning. Um, for the record, if you please introduce yourself. Sure, my name is Sean Burke, and I serve as the Chief of Police in South Carolina. Right. Thank you. Yeah, okay. go ahead. Yeah. Ready to go. Uh, so thanks for sharing this uh, legislation. I've had an opportunity to review it, and I think there are some uh, meaningful action items as it pertains to uh, the relinquishment of firearms um, <coughs> when an abuse prevention order is uh, issued. I think particularly what's important is that the plaintiff's affidavit clearly articulates the particular uh, threat that's posed by firearms and also um, the, the particular nature of how firearms are possessed and stored within a person's home. What's incumbent though, uh, I believe, is that once a family court order is issued in that regard, is that uh, upon service that law enforcement has an opportunity to review um, not only that affidavit, but do an objective investigation, and if need be, then apply uh, for a search warrant to seize those weapons uh, for a lot of different reasons. You know, I think that the objective um, investigation would bring a relevant fact pattern before the court to carefully consider before any such warrant was issued to seize uh, someone's firearms. And then operationally, um, this would be a huge lift for uh, law enforcement <coughs> in the state. And I, I represent a fairly large police organization that we can, we can uh, execute these operations uh, safely. And we're fortunate enough to have uh, the ability to catalog and store uh, firearms, but that's not the case around the state. Um, 
Oftentimes, police uh, organizations are represented by a single police officer or a deputy sheriff covering uh, a vast amount of terrain of, of your constituents' territory. And to just be kind of handed a search warrant and say, go ahead and take care of this and collect all these guns and photograph them and catalog them and store them, that, that system will not work. Um, so th those were my big um, takeaways from the review of the board <coughs> as, as presented. And uh, I was frankly hopeful that you would have you know, direct questions as it related to kind of the practicing of, of law enforcement and it, how it intersects with, with the bill. Thank you. Yeah, sure. So uh, you kind of went through the process. If, if something happened, was that you were talking about the bill or the way it is now? The bill. Okay, that, that's what I thought. Yes. And, and going back to cataloging and storing, um, I'm sure you can't store an unlimited amount of firearms, but how many can your department store? So, as a luxury, only by the good citizens of South Burlington and by retired Chief Whipple, we have the ability to store about 40 firearms. Uh, our but frankly, our, our uh, <coughs> weapons room right now is fairly full. Many, many police departments don't have remotely that ability. So I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna assume it's probably, probably temperature, humidity control, because the reason I'm going there is because there's some people who have some pretty valuable firearms. And um, when you said 40, <laughs> I thought it would be more than that because there's, again, there's people who have large, um, uh, collections. So it, say in that case you can store 40, you've got 30 in there, and you have to uh, confiscate somebody who's got 50, which is not unusual for somebody to have 50 guns. So what would happen then? So we would be really in a hard, uh, a hard place. Right. And again, even with our um, accommodations, we could probably do it. Most police departments cannot do it. Right. And most police departments don't have uh, any really kind of safe or secure areas to store 50 additional firearms. Right. So your storage areas, I mean, is it set up so, I mean, guns are placed in, uh, uh, I guess, proper holders, I guess, or, right. or so racks, we can, or? We can accommodate long guns uh, appropriately. It's not, humid, uh, it's not humidified, dehumidified right, right. space but it's good dry space, sure, and yeah. then we store uh, pistols or handguns in uh, evidentiary boxes that are neatly stacked and stowed. Uh, but again, those are all like, those boxes cost money, that space costs money, uh, and many, <clears throat> most police departments do not have uh, the resources that I'm uh, explaining or outlining. Right. Here. So most, I'll, I'll go to the bigger ones, uh, like Burlington or Rutland, or they would be the next biggest, I'm guessing. For as far as the city goes, do you know what their capacities are? Right, Burlington, I spent 21 years there. They don't have near the capacity. It's filled with crime guns. Um, and it's not as nice and safe as storage as a person probably would expect when we're temporarily holding their firearms. I don't know what Rollin offers. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So you <laughs> mentioned um, wanting the opportunity to, uh, to potentially do an investigation before a warrant was issued. Yes. Um, how long would you foresee such an investigation take? So it would have to be done uh, virtually as soon as you receive the abuse prevention order. Um, and probably upon service, you'd have an actual opportunity to speak with uh, the defendant named in the order to see if there was going to be a voluntary relinquishment, get an idea of the scope of the evidence, and then bring back not only the plaintiff's uh, affidavit, the officer's uh, analysis of the situation, but the defendant's statement, and uh, let the court decide whether or not there are grounds for a search, search warrant to be issued. So, I, I guess I'm trying to understand what that additional investigation brings beyond what would be in an affidavit that would be necessary. I mean, if, if the affidavit of a petitioner is sufficient to, call, uh, to show probable cause, that these are the weapons, these are where they are, there's been abuse uh, that has occurred, uh, and and it's actually a seizure is necessary to protect the life, health, or well-being of a victim. I mean, that needs to be proven in an affidavit. The court needs to find that probable cause. <coughs> now, I can understand the situation if the court didn't find probable cause, that maybe further investigation when the uh, police officer is serving the order, that they find actually further evidence that would establish probable cause. 
I, I guess I'm just, I, I understand the safety concerns that you're, you're raising, but, but the court has to have established probable cause to issue that warrant. And, and I don't see what additional information can be obtained uh, through an investigation. I mean, I do think that a police officer should have the option when they serve the order to try to get the voluntary relinquishment, but then if it's not going to be voluntary, to go ahead with the warrant, which gives the opportunity to seize. I would assume that would be part of how a police officer would approach the situation if they have a warrant, uh, if they can get the volunteer, <coughs> you know, volunteer uh, the person to volunteer them to come and get the firearms. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm commenting more than asking a question. I will have a couple questions, I guess, as well. But, but it just concerns me that, that in these situations, needing to either get the person, uh, the perpetrator out of the situation or the guns out of the situation. And as you weren't here when we were talking about how difficult it can be to get the perpetrator really out of the situation because not being able to hold without bail because of misdemeanor charges, etc. cetera. Uh, so we're really aiming at enforceability of getting the guns out of the situation. Um, so I've gone on, I guess, I mean, if you could comment as far as, as what, no, I think uh, essentially we're saying almost identically the same things, where I uh, agree with your analysis of the legal standard and the process, uh, but I, maybe my lens is on the operational side, where what I envision is a, a lonely police officer somewhere being dropped an abuse prevention order and a search warrant and then tasked with somehow executing that without having any part of the investigation um, to one judge for our, for our own operational uh, reasons, uh, how we were going to approach that, and then two, to actually do an analysis of what needs to be done here. Um, I, I think that when any time that we're endeavoring to apply for a search warrant to go into someone's home, that you know the court has told us that that is uh, the most sanctimonious place, right, for for an individual. And I just think that uh, further investigation beyond what perhaps um, the plaintiff has offered at family court um, without an, an investigator kind of looking at it, evaluating the facts, talking with a, a prosecutor before presenting a fact pattern before the court for a search warrant. But, but again, if the, the court has looked at the evidence to establish probable cause and they've either had the evidence or not. Now, a question, if, if operationally you, you, you have the order, you have the search warrant, uh, you go to serve the, the order, uh, and you have the warrant as well, I, could there be a situation where you, you kind of are checking out the situation and it seems like it's more dangerous for an individual police officer to do something that they can have some discretion to be holding off until they get back up or whatever the, the case might be? I mean, it's, how does that work operationally? You know, you have the ability to go there. You can ask the person's not going to do it, seems very angry, seems high on methamphetamine, whatever, that's a very dangerous situation. I'm going to hold off on that warrant until you know, I figure out the safety. I mean, is that a scenario that can happen, or is that not how? <coughs> it certainly is a scenario that can happen. Um, and in Chittenden County, we do have the luxury of bringing other resources via mutual aid uh, to a situation like that. But other communities don't, don't enjoy that. And uh, you know, quite frankly, the expectations of uh, perfect outcomes in these situations are, are really high for the police. And uh, before we're executing a search warrant, uh, I would want my investigators involved in uh, the lead up and gathering all the evidence, having a true barometer on the facts as presented before the court, having the objective eye of an investigator before bringing the search warrant before the court. The abuse prevention order is different because we're not going to potentially force our way into uh, a place where there are known uh, risks, being the firearms. Um, when we're serving the abuse prevention order, oftentimes uh, they are a vacate order and those situations are volatile enough. We're exponentially kind of escalating that if we're gonna go in and then start seizing personal property. And I just feel it's important that the police uh, have a hand in the investigation to lead up to that. So, I, I, I don't think we're talking past each other, but I, I'm trying to, to focus on the warrant can issue, I mean, can the investigation really be what you're talking about, the evidence that you're gathering and such, doesn't seem to go so much to 
whether that warrant, warrant should be issued because probable cause is established, it, it's safely executing that warrant. I mean, is that, I mean, is there a place in this kind of situation where, yeah, the relief from abuse order could be served, but the, the police definitely have the, the discretion uh, to figure out how and when it's safe to deliver that warrant. I mean, we want it to be there. We want it to be able to be delivered right away. But obviously, if there's a concern about the safety of the situation, the volatility of the situation, we would trust the police to exercise its discretion in figuring out how best to exer exercise that warrant. I mean, it's, it seems to be two things. It's probable cause there are guns there, there's been abuse, and there's a finding that continuing to have those guns there is going to lead to bad outcomes. And I do understand, though, that police going into the situation have other concerns as well. I'm trying to sort those out and how, and do we really need something in this bill or is it standard operating practice that, if we put in here the warrant, are we saying that you have no choice, you have to march up there and deliver <coughs> that warrant immediately or using your discretion to do it safely? Right. Yeah. the latter. We would absolutely need uh, full discretion um, on you know, how, when to, to execute, absolutely. Um, but in, and perhaps um, I'm just thinking about it from an evidence uh, integrity standpoint and having been beat up on the stand a few times about the content of search warrant affidavits and uh, you know it, it's incumbent on the police to establish that the information that we have provided the court is absolutely true. And I just wonder if by a single affiant going forward before the court offering a fact pattern that then issues a search warrant, like, where does that leave the, uh, like in the context of a suppression hearing, where, where does that go? Who does that lie with if the warrant's challenged? And why wouldn't we have the opportunity to have an investigation uh, before a warrant was issued? So I guess it's not the evidence, it's not um, the, the right, like 51% likely that the evidence is in this spot. It's not that, it's the lead up. Like how have we cooperated that we know that this is a, a good factual basis in order to issue a warrant for this home? So who would be ch who would be challenged in the situation um, subsequent that this was more there wasn't probable cause? What I'm hearing is when the police have been the affiant and have gone to the court to seek the search warrant, they have to back it up. But in this situation, it's the individual who came to the court. So, but all right, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm, I, I just had one question. So, so, so there's the initial investigation with the usually the domestic assault, where probable cause is established, as um, Representative Malone was talking about. Is one of your concerns that time gap between when this order would be issued and how things would change in that house, and whether the defendant can either acquire more guns or you know, go somewhere with the guns or anything like that? Is that why you're feeling there should be an additional investigation? No, I think in cases where you're actually investigating an underlying assault and you've been party to the investigation all along, I think those are clear um, case for fact patterns for us. What, a, what is a concern for us is uh, a, an order that's potentially obtained uh, at the court or at another police department, but the, the uh, defendant's uh, residence happens to be in our jurisdiction where we're now presented not only with the abuse prevention order to serve, but a search warrant to serve, and uh, then the downstream impacts of having to serve that search warrant. And like, I don't know who would be challenged on the evidence, but I certainly do know who would be challenged on uh, the liability of any police operation that goes on there. Uh, and then also the downstream impact of, you know, if someone obtains a uh, abuse prevention order, say, at my station house, but yet they live uh, in, in Hinesburg, and the Hinesburg police aren't on, and then they call out a state trooper to go deal with that. You know, who has the resources then to adequately to conduct this uh, operation? And in your example, although it's probably real life, we served the abuse prevention order, we kind of asked some probative questions about uh, firearms, and said, hey, would you, while well, I'm there by myself, would you mind turning those over? And the defendant's like, well, they're not here, don't worry about it. And I know that I can't carry that out in the moment. When I go away, I can't secure the scene both and call for help probably. Uh, what, where can those guns end up? So I think there are some careful considerations because we would have to in a very, very timely fashion serve the abuse prevention order and this would start in live time. I would just rather be part, more part of that investigative process before the, you know, leading up to the search warrant. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Clears up.
time. So, um, about three and a half years ago, I, I got a, a, a whole new view of what you people do in your job. My son became a uh, police officer. So, and one thing you said that really raised a concern with me, I, I know that, uh, I mean, we, we've talked about it and, and discussed it, that uh, uh, domestic situations can be volatile, whether it's uh, the victim, responding officer, whatever. And then, in, in, uh, if I heard you right, <clears throat> you had a concern with the way uh, the procedure would have to go now, that it could make it even more of a concern for you? Did, did I hear that, as far as uh, potential danger goes to a police officer? The, the way it's written in, in the bill compared to the way that uh, you, would, you would like to do it? I, I do feel it would be a big ask of our rural communities with uh, generally like one officer on uh, to go out and try to not only serve an abuse prevention order, which may be vacated or not, and then uh, search and seize firearms. Right. So, the, so the, with the uh, um, bringing uh, an RFA is one thing, but you know, there's a certain level of concern there, but to do a, a search and seizure, it's gonna notch it up even. But I think, but I think we need the ability to do so. Right. But we need to be part of the investigation, so we know exactly, um, you know, what what the evidence from the <clears throat> plaintiff is telling us, what we have learned throughout our objective investigation, and then operationally marry that up with a good, safe plan that's resourced in order to be able to deal with the evidence. Right. Right. And that I'm going to assume wouldn't be going by yourself to do a search and seizure. No, and you know. Uh, <clears throat> I think we reported to the, the state police last week that you know in South Carolina, I think we have four or five, maybe six guns potentially in our evidence locker pursuant to um, abuse prevention orders currently. But South Burlington's kind of not what I know um, Vermont to be, where it's very common to have upwards of a dozen or more guns if you're an outdoorsman. Um, and I just think the downstream impacts on small police departments uh, are insurmountable. I don't know how, um, I, I started my career with a five-person police department. I don't know how the Woodstock police would be able to catalog and store 50, 60 guns um, for a temporary uh, situation. Yeah, and, and to me, I mean, I don't mean to downplay, but that's insignificant to me. This, yeah. your, your safety is, Thank you. is, is more of a concern to me. So the Woodstock situation, that's not an issue of <clears throat> whether there was probable cause for that warrant. I mean, that, that's not, a, I mean, the issue that I'm hearing from you, and I think it's a completely legitimate issue, uh, there's a couple. Uh, one is the resources to execute that. The second is the safety to execute that. Yes, then there's the third of whether the search warrant is appropriate. Well, well, that's, in my view, again, is in the court's realm and, and whether the court issues that warrant and whether it's found probable cause from whatever affidavits or evidence that's been presented when they've sought the relief from abuse order. And, and so it, those seem to be different issues to me. I, I completely understand that the law enforcement wants to not just willy nilly go out to a potentially volatile situation. Um, I don't know trying to figure out if there's something in the bill that can sort those things out. Uh, because, you know, again, we don't want to put law enforcement in harm's way. You know, with, you know, they, they, are, they are always in harm's way, I understand that, <coughs> without the safety precautions. But again, the Woodstock situation, these other situations, how to store, how to have the resources to go out there and safely execute the warrant is still a different issue. Uh, as you know, I do understand, yeah, could it be a stronger basis for a search warrant? Well, it still has to have a strong enough basis to have phone problem caused by the court. So, so if, if there are other ideas that you have, and you don't have to have them right now, as far as how to really pinpoint and address those issues that I think are very critical that you're raising uh, regarding safety and resources, I think that's very important. But I'm, I guess I'm just not convinced that it's at the issuance of the warrant that, that is the critical component. But. Right, and I guess, uh, you know, thank you for the remarks about uh, safety and storage and capacity, um, but back to the issue at hand with the evidence. 
And you know, perhaps it's just my experience with applying for uh, hundreds of search warrants uh, over the years is that uh, we have to be extremely careful when dealing with evidence that we're bringing before the court, um, particularly hearsay evidence, and, and verify the veracity and validity of that uh, information and make a good uh, faith affidavit before the court before that's issued. And those, in my experience, have always been on the heels of a <coughs> fulsome investigation. And I don't know how that will relate to um, the ability to go into a uh, family court and fill out uh, an affidavit there and apply directly to the court for a search warrant. That's just confusing to me, but that's more of a process question. So may maybe it's a, um, the, the different kind of scenarios as far as why one's seeking a search warrant. In this situation, we're not seeking a search warrant to gather evidence of a crime. I, and, and I can understand you need to have every, all the T's crossed and the I's dotted uh, to hold that up in court, that this evidence can be introduced, that the search warrant was appropriate, that it was properly executed, et cetera. That's not the purpose of this search warrant. It is to remove the firearms from the dangerous situation. So I don't know if that makes it somewhat different. May, I mean, I, I can't imagine this may be a new kind of situation of a search warrant, because again, you're not evidence gathering. I mean, does that make a difference in, in what one needs or what? Well, and again, we may, maybe we're not uh, seeking evidence, maybe we are, and maybe we need to parse that out too, because- It could be, right. right, right. Uh, we, the gun could have been in play in, in the criminal act that's initially alleged or in other criminal acts that are later learned about because we know about the historical buildup in domestic violence cases. So um, I hear what you're saying and I can see where that's a little uh, disconnected with our lived experience as police officers now and, and when we see warrants. But uh, it occurs to me though that it, it still would be troublesome to be have a, an abuse prevention order and a search warrant um, immediately placed on police departments in Vermont to then go out and, and try to figure out on their own on how to, how to get that done. Again, bigger police departments, we can, we can definitely do that. We have the human resources, we have the training, we have the tactics in order to do these things, um, but they're very, very complicated. Uh, it's where we, we present uh, our highest amount of risk and the public expects, rightly so, um, the best possible outcomes. Sure. So I, I just keep trying to think about, because it seems like it's so important to both keep the public safe and not have law enforcement, you know, one officer walking into a scene that they can't control. So this is like a very, you know, half, I'm just sort of brainstorming in my head. So I'm wondering if there's some either specialized training, like the whole state police, the rest of the state, I can't wrap my hands around yet. But what if there were something like a Kuzi unit that was specialized in the metro area where there was sort of backup for a big area that could go in and help do that and store things, like joint storage so that again, just like we train DRE um, folks, yeah, I mean, I think those models are, are great in, uh, in structure, but we're all starving to find qualified folks. We all have vacancies. I, I don't know where those human resources would eventually come from. And again, it's not to take away from the exigency of these circumstances. Um, what I'm asking for or suggesting uh, that is at least considered is that the uh, investigators have a crack at this evidence and then go back to the court and say, we need a warrant in this instance. And can you talk about, are there other times that you're taking things from people in a situation, I mean, I know guns are like in a class of their own in terms of danger and people feeling pretty sensitive about that, but are police officers going in in some cases and removing paraffin, drug, power, like something that isn't as um, sort of emotionally charged? Certainly, so if an officer finds themselves um, <coughs> legally present somewhere and you see evidence of a crime or, or a contraband, we seize those things. 
We also, uh, because of exigent circumstances, will either make entry or seize evidence uh, and then seek a, a court order. Um, but those are in the totality of the circumstances of the events right in front of you. And just quickly, I'll, I'll say, like, I stopped a car yesterday and uh, the, the operator said, hey, I've got a gun right here on my front seat. Well, I told him, well, as long as you don't reach for it, we're good. Um, you know, so it's not just you know, about guns. We, have, we deal with evidence um, regardless of what it is in, in the framework of the law. And there are, there are those few times that we do either through exigent circumstances, being lawfully present pursuant to an arrest or pursuant to an order that we seize evidence. And is that evidence stored as carefully as guns are, like in a uh, climate controlled room or like in some of these cars, like is it just parked in a lot somewhere or how does that work? Yeah, so cars can be, uh, while they're a waiting process, uh, oftentimes they're in a, a garage, a station, uh, and then they're stored outside. But just like through the matter of processing that, it, if you drop a, a wallet, that's evidence. That's not a big deal, right? If you drop someone's, uh, you know, over under $3,500 shotgun, that's a big deal. Um, and, you know, the space that it, in which it takes to store those things, uh, that those are all really different uh, things to think about. Uh, I had a question about, um, so I'm just trying to understand procedurally, a question that relates to your suggestion, which is, my, my understanding is people could pursue um, temporary or final relief from abuse orders in civil court and never it's initiate a criminal proceeding, right? Yes. Domestic violence charges. And so... Um, thinking about your suggestion that the investigator would um, kind of be part of the determination of whether a warrant was called for in that instance, I think that's what I'm hearing your suggestion to be. Is there always a consistent role for police as investigators if someone hasn't in, in the final order, if someone has not, you know, isn't pursuing criminal charges, which I think is quite common? Um, would there be a consistent role for a police investigator already in those instances, or would we be creating a new role if we, if we move forward with your team? No, so the, the same intersect would exist. The minute the order came to the police for service, um, we were responsible, and that's when we get involved. And I think uh -huh. that that process is fine. Um, I just um, feel as though that if we're gonna receive an abuse prevention order, it's gonna alert us that there's a firearms relinquishment that we uh, as investigators owe it um, to go out and do an objective investigation and then have the ability, which the, uh, the enhancements in the plaintiff affidavit as to you know, the scope of the evidence, where is the evidence, it's gonna be very, very helpful. And then the ability to go um, maybe even right back to the same family court judge to say, yes, we need a search warrant in order to seize these firearms and make this situation safe. And are you, and are you talking about just in the instance of the final order or both the temporary and final order? Both temporary yeah. and final. So much. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, it feels like a lot more. Yeah. Good day. Uh, James Pepper, Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs. Um, so the only sections of this bill as introduced uh, that really impact criminal court processes or the core functions of the state's attorneys are sections 6 through 12, um, which really are related to extreme risk protection orders and um, conditions of release. So, but, you know, to the extent that any of the other sections impact public safety, um, I'd be happy to comment on them or take questions. Um, with respect to um, allowing household or family members to kind of initiate the extreme risk protection order, um, state's attorneys have no problems with that. They think it's good policy. There are questions about how the role of the household member 
interplays with the state's attorney in subsequent proceedings. Um, you know, if there's a family member seeking the ex parte emergency order, does the state's attorney have party standing at the subsequent hearing for the final order? Um, you know, traditionally the state's attorneys or the assistant attorney generals are the <coughs> gatekeepers of extreme risk protection orders. So just the interplay of that gatekeeping function as the order moves forward. Um, I think it would probably be similar to the way the RFA works and the state's attorney would not be involved in the final hearing. But uh, there was just some questions about that interplay. Um, so any clarification on that might be helpful um, in the appeal process too. If, someone, if, one, if a final is issued and someone wants to appeal that. Um, <coughs> Um, there are, uh, you know, we were, I think, very strongly supportive of allowing um, healthcare providers to uh, inform law enforcement of an extreme risk of harm to self or others um, that would initiate, again, an ERPO petition. Um, we were sad to see that language go last year, and we're happy that it's back. Um, so, and I think, you know, as Eric Fitzpatrick mentioned, we think that it's already covered, but for a belt and suspenders approach, um, you know, it might be good just to spell it out for the healthcare providers. We have heard some concerns. Yeah, um, I think this is a question I asked the other day, but um, with healthcare providers, um, <clears throat> I'm thinking of somebody in the, in the psychiatry field. And so, uh, what's the, uh, the issue with, or potential issues with HIPAA around that? Right. Well, so I'm not an expert on HIPAA, uh, but you know there are there are exceptions to HIPAA um, that are federal, um, and we have state exceptions to HIPAA as well. Um, and I think the healthcare providers had reached out and said we believe that this is a federal ex exemption to HIPAA already, um, but just to be double, triple sure that we want to you know they don't want to risk losing their license so. They want to just have it in our state law as well, just to make sure that uh, they can report that. Right. That's pretty much what I heard the other day, too. I just wanted to verify. Um, and then, uh, you know, the, the condition of release relating to relinquishment of firearms, it's a pretty standard condition. It's applied in almost every domestic violence case <coughs> already. Um, spelling it out. I mean, most court forms already have it on there, but to make it clear, make it standard, make it consistent across all counties, uh, and just know, have everyone be aware that, you know, it's a standard condition. Um, very, very helpful. Um, and again, the other sections of the bill, to the extent they impact public safety, I'd be happy to answer any questions about them. So I guess I'm not sure I understood the are you concerned about the adding family or household member or how we are doing it? Or I, I just wasn't clear on. We, uh, the state attorneys do not have any concerns about adding it. I mean, I think that there is a concern that I've heard about whether household members um, should be contacting judges in the middle of the night for an, ex for an emergency order, an ex parte right. order. Um, there is a process for seeking an RFA after hours. I think there could be a process developed for for seeking an turbo after hours. So we don't have any concerns about that. Our only concern is how the state's attorneys or the attorney generals play into a order that's been initiated by a family or household member. Because um, essentially our gatekeeping role has been removed. There's no, we don't have any concern with that. Um, but just the, the idea is, do we show up to the subsequent hearings? Um, are we? party to the appeals. Okay. A question that came to mind, I guess it, and it may be a question for the judge more than you, but um, through the whole court system, is this going to put a uh, an additional burden on? Do, do you mean, is more, I guess, is more work expected for the court system? Uh, I know, no. you know, through the yeah. court system, it's, uh, you know, as far as uh, their work goes, or to the max as it is so you know I would say that with respect to ERPOs there hasn't been an incredible substantial increased burden uh, the number of ERPOs uh, hasn't overwhelmed the state's attorneys it was an additional it was an additional thing that we're doing now um, it's an important thing um, that we're doing uh, 
if you add household members and they're, it's totally separate from the state's attorney's office and that would be a question for the court. Um, if we're involved in the kind of gatekeeping process at all, it could be an additional pressure, but you know, the number of ERPOs filed isn't something that we, you know, it hasn't overwhelmed our, either our on-call state's attorneys or our uh, just regular hour state's attorneys. So you, you don't foresee it stretching your resources? Depending on how it works out. I mean, to me, it sounds like this is gonna to be totally separate from ERPOs that are initiated right. through our office. So to the extent that is true, it wouldn't impact us at all. Right, okay. Yeah. So, um, a very basic question having to do with what we heard from uh, Chief Burke. So, does law enforcement go directly to the court to seek a warrant, or is there state's attorney's involvement when a warrant <coughs> in these situations? Uh, state's are attorneys sought? are always involved. So, it, so, it's law enforcement doing an investigation, uh, working then with the state's attorney to ensure that just the application kind of checks all the boxes. Yeah. What kind of time frame? How, how long does it? generally take to obtain a search warrant? A um, couple hours, you know, someone pulls someone over and wants to search the car and, you know, they'll call the on-call state's attorney or the, the state's attorney's office, okay. review the application, it can happen, you know, that can happen roadside. Right, right. okay, great, thanks. violence and the issues and procedures around this bill um, is incredibly complicated, is what he said. Um, I think that's been borne out by the testimony and some of the questions by the individual representatives um, as recently as, as uh, Chief Burke when he talked about search warrants um, being complicated and presenting the highest level of risk for them. What, in, in my role, uh, obviously this bill involves a number of policy decisions for the legislature to make, and in my role, I'm not here to support uh, or oppose this bill, but what I hope to do during the course of my testimony is outline what I consider the potential impacts on the judiciary if this bill is adopted as, as written. Uh, and some of the concerns I have over the procedures uh, that are, uh, have been discussed and are set forth in this bill. I would ask the committee, as they're listening to me and considering the testimony they've heard, to keep uh, a, a couple of overarching issues in mind. Um, first of all, there is a significant difference in the process and procedure when we're talking about an emergency <coughs> or temporary That's critical to understanding the different procedures that come into play with that. Um, there obviously is a, a difference between the civil process and the criminal process, which has been highlighted by, by some of the, the witnesses. Um, I think it's important to understand uh, the difference between the, the temporary procedures and the 
final procedures. What I will try to do is comment on those procedures that are outlined in this bill and my concerns and hopefully offer some suggestions uh, to remedy uh, what I see as some of the problems. Um, and I would hope the committee would feel that members would be comfortable with them. Interrupting at, at any point in the process. The other, the other point I would make that you need to keep in mind is we have been talking, or at least the testimony as I've heard it, we've been discussing RFA orders as if they were uh, of a generic variety. And I think Representative Triber asked about an average RFA. I will tell you that there is nothing average about any RFA. <coughs> Every one of these cases is handled on an individual basis, and the way this bill is framed, um, and I understand the, the, the policy and the, the issues behind it, it talks as if there was only one type of RFA, and that is an RFA that involves intimate partners. And quite frankly, there are a number of entities that come before us that are not intimate partners. There are brothers who uh, end up uh, fighting with each other. There are parents who bring action, uh, um, relief from abuse actions against their children. Um, we talked about, uh, Representative Burdett uh, asked about stay away or no contact orders. Many of these orders are issued and why there's no such thing as an average order is people can ask for individual claims for relief. It's certainly often the case, if not in every case, in an intimate partner relationship where they ask for a no contact or stay away. <clears throat> but there are those intimate uh, partner uh, complaints that also only seek no abuse or harassment, and they don't want the person to leave the house. And so I think as you're listening to the testimony and considering the issues presented by this bill, you have to keep in mind that there's more than one population that will be impacted by this. And, and going back to the question that uh, Representative uh, Trevor, 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 I was wrestling with which way to go on that. So <laughs> I'll try to fifty chance. Yeah, well, I lost. Um, he, he questioned the idea of it being shall impose uh, a condition of relinquishment in every single temporary order and final order, and. There are some situations where that may not be appropriate. Clearly, it's an intimate, and, and certainly the, the situation that was described uh, by Courtney's allies it, it is, a, is the type of situation where clearly that would be appropriate. Um, but there may be these other situations where someone doesn't want to be vacated, doesn't want the defendant vacated from the house, or a family relationship that is not doesn't involve an intimate relationship where that order would be unnecessary. But if it's mandated, if it's a shell, we don't have any have any choice. At this point, under the current uh, law, the court does have the discretion, assuming the evidence is there to warrant that, that type of order, that we can order it. And it is done. But it is clearly handled on a case-by-case -case, uh, basis, depending on the evidence that is uh, presented to us. Um, and I have discussed uh, with this, this issue about uh, every order calling for that relinquishment uh, is something that I've been discussing with uh, the domestic violence representatives for going on years now. And when a case is before a judge, they are supposed to be deciding that case based on the evidence that's presented to them. And in almost every one of these cases, or certainly by far the majority, we're dealing with unrepresented individuals. Neither one is represented by an attorney. So the court is always uh, in a situation of a fine line, walking a fine line between hearing the case, hearing the evidence that the parties present to us, and making sure we have the evidence to make the decision. But we cannot create the case for either party, either the plaintiff helping the plaintiff with their burden or the defense with their defense. And so one of the things, and I'll, I'll go to the bill itself, but there's been a discussion about a provision in the bill that calls for the plaintiff to include in a new complaint form all the information uh, about knowledge of guns, the type <coughs> of guns, where the guns are in the home or the car. 
And I understand um, and have talked with the domestic violence <coughs> folks about that reoccurring issue of them not wanting to have the plaintiff uh, provide that information and leaving it up to the court to, to bring it out in the course of a hearing. So in the simplest terms, if that information, and, and I'm not taking a position whether it should be in this complaint or not, but if that information is not forthcoming in a request for an emergency order, a temporary order, there will be no search warrant. Mm -hmm. um, and then it's a question, if, if there's no evidence in that affidavit of guns or firearms being an issue, um, then there clearly won't be a warrant. There will be no basis for it under the the, the uh, guidelines that the New Jersey court have issued. Um, and when you get into a hearing, um, assuming there's nothing in an affidavit, a temporary order is granted, they come in for a final hearing. The court decides the case based on the evidence that's presented during the course of that <coughs> hearing. It may or may not be the same evidence that's in the affidavit that was filed. We decide it based on the testimony that's presented. So if there's nothing in the affidavit to, to indicate to the court that there's even an issue with firearms, if the plaintiff on their own uh, does not raise the issue of the use of firearms or the presence of firearms, it is not the court's obligation to then open up an issue that otherwise hasn't been raised by the parties. Now some judges will, they will ask about firearms, but not every judge will. It's not it, it's how they view their role in that proceeding. Um, so that's, I, I think, one of the areas where clearly it is complicated to understand where this committee should go on that provision. But the, that, from a court's perspective, that's the problem. Um, I understand why they don't want the information coming forward, but without it, we're going to be limited in what we can do in this bill. Um, so Judge, you raise a really important point about how different all of these are, and it's <coughs> helpful to think about that. But that just made me think about um, the case, well, a couple of cases, one that I saw in court where one side actually had legal counsel and the other side didn't, mm -hmm. which was also quite um, an interesting contrast. But if somebody is no longer, you know, it's an ex-boyfriend, they moved out seven months ago or something, that person may have no knowledge of you know, the person's gotten, you know, angrier and angrier. When they lived together, he didn't have guns. But in some cases, the person's not going to be able to know the answer to that. And I would hate for us to err on the wrong side. And as you said, some judges are going to say, are there guns involved? But the person filing the RFA won't always know that. I, I understand that. That's what I'm saying. That, you know, it, there, there's no average or there's no... Right. It, it depends on whatever evidence is presented to the court, and it may be that the history that's presented by the parties, the, the, the escalating nature of the behavior, it may prompt a particular judge to ask and inquire about firearms. So but, if it's only it may, like, might it make sense for us to look at asking the court to inquire because it could have been a, a year that passed or something. I, I don't, I would, I'm, I would be very concerned if, if the legislature starts telling okay. judges what they have to ask. Okay. That, I guess I'll leave it at that. <coughs> um, <coughs> thank you, Judge. Um, I, I think you're, you're talking about a, the point that's sort of stuck with me a little bit. I'm trying to figure out, um, and I don't know if you have any ideas about how we try to standardize a process across the states, regardless of which judge a person is sitting in front of, um, they're able to access uh, the, um, or the, and, and the amount of, you, you mentioned that a lot of people aren't represented by attorneys in these situations, so. By far the majority are not represented in the situation. Um, the representative mentioned where there's an attorney on one side makes mm -hmm. it even more difficult to, to create that balance of not assisting the party that's unrepresented. 
I just didn't know if you had any thoughts about how to balance things out across the state, regardless of who a person is <coughs> as a judge or which where where the person is or their amount of knowledge that they have as a, a in in legal matters. Balancing out what the what the what knowledge what the outcomes look has? like for the so we talked about how if they don't mention firearms, the court doesn't necessarily know that firearms could or should be an issue uh, if it's not mentioned somewhere. Um, and I know you just, your last statement before I was uh, called on was that you're concerned about the legislature telling a court what they should be looking at, and I understand that as well. I think only because that's really a slippery slope. How far do you go in, in, in telling the court or any judge how to conduct a particular <coughs> hearing. I think the issue of firearms, there's no question, it is a, a significant issue. And it's one that, um, it, it, keep in mind you have 30 independently appointed judges. Um, I, I'm not in a position in my role to tell them how they have to conduct a hearing. Um, and I, I think the issue of firearms is one where I think it's one that has to be brought out. It's a question of how it's brought out mm -hmm. um, in these proceedings. And it's, it's so fact dependent on what information is before the court um, that I don't know if you're ever going to standardize um, how a particular hearing is, is conducted. Yeah, I think that, that's the hard part because you're not dealing with a if A then B situation. This, these are people in different situations. There, there are different situations. They could be <coughs> the result of an incident that occurred two days before the hearing. It could be a history. Uh, the real history is back six months or a year before. Um, for instance, the, the, the situation I described earlier this morning, the, the parties hadn't been together for seven, seven months. Um, that, that's, that's not uncommon to have folks coming in seeking orders long after a relationship is ended for the same kind of behavior that was described here, the, the, particularly with social media and the ability to reach out to someone uh, when you don't have physical contact. And, and so I, I'm not saying, I'm not taking a position on whether it should be part of every order. I'm just saying there are consequences that, that haven't been discussed yeah, before, absolutely. if it is in there. Um, without that in there, if it's a may, then you are looking to the individual judge uh, to, based on the information that's before him or her, uh, to make a decision. And many judges, uh, because of the nature of the matter, will make that inquiry. But that inquiry, ultimately, the information has to come from the plaintiff. There's no other way of, of, of getting the information out. Yeah, because remember that and there's another part of the bill that I'll, I'll address, but remember when the, the defendant comes in on a relief from abuse, even if they are not charged with a crime, the potential is always there uh, that the evidence will show a crime may have occurred. And so in every situation, either a defendant comes in with it on the end of a relief from abuse order charged with a domestic violence of some sort, or not, but the potential is there because of the evidence. And so uh, the first thing usually a judge will do <coughs> talking with the defendant is give that advice. You are not charged with a criminal offense, but this is a public proceeding, your testimony is being recorded, and you have the right to take the Fifth Amendment. And so many uh, defendants will not testify because they can't. So another, again, another part of this bill that talks about uh, if, if initially a warrant is issued in, in, or an order of relinquishment, the shall um, relinquish firearms is issued at the time of a temporary order. This bill, one part of it says later on when you get into the final hearing, the court can ask the defendant, do you have fire? If the defendant says under oath, I do not have firearms, then you vacate that relinquishment. And there's some <coughs> question about whether we should add credibility to that or not. But the fact of the matter is, I can't ask that question. 
because if there's an order of relinquishment that I've had to uh, issue as a result of a temporary order, that the person is not to possess firearms, I cannot ask him uh, without giving him that warning that if you then tell me truthfully I have a <coughs> he's he's admitting a crime. So uh, there are certainly circumstances where I don't think I will be able to ask that question that would relieve the obligation uh, by the mandatory requirement. Thank you. Um, so I'm hearing you, you don't like shall and you don't like us to tell you what to do. Um, well, but I'm, I'm saying the consequences of shall. I, 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 I'm concerned about... Sure, sure. Let, well, let me throw out another just for you to comment on this. And I don't know if this is what we would want to do, but I mean, if there is a presumption that, that an order will have a relinquishment, yeah, and unless, you know, I don't know what the burden would be for or what the court would have to find to not issue that. I mean, it could be the situation where well, they're not vacating, they don't want this, whatever. I mean, but the presumption is on every one of the RFAs, whatever the cause is, there will be relinquishment unless the court finds that. So you could, I suppose, define the population that it applies to. <coughs> say that in cases involving intimate partner relationships, however you want to define that, is that it would be across the board. So that there's some discretion um, the court can exercise. I'm, again, I'm looking at the, at the, at the temporary order. <coughs> you know. and, and I guess I'm looking at domestic violence a little broader than intimate relationship. I, I perceive the parent-child in the same home. I see the brother-brother brother in the same, or city, whatever, uh, kind of under that umbrella. And, and would want something like at least a presumption uh, unless there is some sort of finding that the court makes uh, that there shouldn't be the relinquishment component of the order. So again, you... Because that's a different, you know, that's, I understand your approach, but I'm... And the only thing I would say to that is, again, you've got to look at <coughs> what point are you in the process. If you're talking about a temporary order, there's not going to be any contradictory evidence anyway as opposed to a final order when the defendant has an opportunity to talk. So if there's a presumption, there's no way of rebutting that presumption on a late night phone call. Um, and again, even in those family situations, um, I, I agree with you. I, I don't dispute that there are certainly family situations where it's appropriate. But if someone is not asking to vacate the premises, um, and they want the person to continue to live in the home, Depending on what the nature of the relationship is, it may or may not be appropriate to have the guns removed. But so, what evidence does a court have to see to issue the relinquishment of component of the order? Evidence of firearms. What's that? Evidence <coughs> of firearms. That, that, it, it's that, it, on one hand, it's that simple. And on the other hand, it's that complicated. Right. It's complicated because if, if you accept the position that's been proffered this morning that they don't want that information in the affidavit, <coughs> then there will be no evidence. So, so I would take it to a different level. One day. I mean, is that there, there may not be any firearm that's owned or controlled at that point, but when that relinquishment uh, order is put in place, the person can't subsequently obtain a firearm legally. So, I mean, that's... <coughs> And that's why, I mean, I think the presumption that it should always be put in there um, because the person, <coughs> still, even without, you know, there may not be any evidence that the person doesn't have a fire because it doesn't. But that doesn't stop that person from in the next day because we're now at a very dangerous point in time when a, when a relief of abuse order is sought. So, again, I think, you know, Having it just May doesn't seem satisfactory <coughs> least to me. I'm, I'm willing to try to understand a better and, approach. And I'm not, as I said, I'm not taking a position right. whether it should be shall or may. I'm just telling you the consequences. <coughs> if it is shall, then these are some of the repercussions that will obviously sure. involve everything. That, that's why I'm saying that's a policy decision for the, the lawyer. 
I'm not arguing with you. No, no, I understand. Yeah, but I'm, <laughs> I'm just saying those right. are the consequences that, uh, that may apply in cases other than some of the, the, the uh, examples that have come before. But, it, but if you have any, and, and the reason I raise the presumption is that seems somewhat between the shell and may, and if there's something <coughs> else that could be workable that doesn't have these issues that you perceive from, from your perspective on these, I mean, it would be helpful. And it doesn't sound like a presumption is an answer. I, I mean, I hadn't thought about it before. I'm, I'm glad to. If you can ponder it more. Yeah, thanks. So, actually, I'm, I'm looking at the time, Your Honor. Are you um, available after we get off the floor? After Did, what? After we get off the floor. What time do you get off the floor? Depends on how shabby people are. I don't think that I'm otherwise. Yeah I, yeah, I don't know if there's much on the floor today. Yeah, I'm looking right now. No, there's there's nothing. Right. There's, it should be very short. Okay, all right. It's the, it's the, um, yeah, 130. Yeah, 130. Yeah. yeah, or we can, um, oh. you know, we can call or we just, you know. Like, <coughs> yeah, okay, all right. Okay, thanks. And then um, that way we can take more time and, um, and also be helpful for you to, um, actually go through the bill and, and show us, yeah. I've been trying to get there. Yeah, I know, I know. So, but I don't want to rush it, so. No, no. Okay, great. I don't know. Okay, great. All right. Yeah. Yeah, just that's me five days. No, it's still no.